okay, in 1949 you have communist China coming into existence. Simultaneously you have the Chinese island of Formosa declaring itself to be the official Republic of China, which we just call Taiwan today. All right, that situation still exists. Now, what's China's position going to be when it comes into existence as Communist China in 1949? I made a little uh, uh, map here, uh, and they're going to say, you remember what I said about Russia when Communist Russia comes into existence. All right. They say, hey, look, we're surrounded by hostile European-based states, overwhelmingly capitalist, but the point is we're surrounded by hostile states. Look at all the circles I put on here. Western allies and Turkic peoples who are sympathetic uh, to rebellious Chinese Turks. Whatever the point is, there's the Western powers uh, uh, appear to be out in the West. You have the British in the South over here, although technically the British left in 1947, but this was par had been part of the British Empire, was still informally allied to it. Southeast Asia, where you see the French in control, all right, the Philippines is a U.S. ally. It was an ex, it would become, a, it was a, in fact, it was a colony of the United States. In 1946, Korea would be on the verge of U.S. military intervention in 1953, the following year. Japan, of course, was at this time, 1949, a tight U.S. ally, having lost World War II. The United States and Japanese become fast friends. And if you think that communist China would look Long uh, would look uh, compassionately or certainly uh, collegially uh, to the north where you have Russia, communist Russia, never think it just because uh, you have communist uh, Russians and communist Chinese do not think they get along because they're communists. Hardly. Capitalists don't get along, neither do communists. In fact, Russia had been responsible for a large portion, uh, uh, large lands being ceded from China over here. I've marked them off over here. That was by Russians. And then, of course, the Russians extended their political umbrella over Mongolia. And so that to sort of uh, was uh, pissed off the Chinese. And so you can understand in 1949, the Chinese were saying to themselves, hey, look, we're a new communist state here. We're set upon by expansionist imperial powers. Is there anywhere along our borders where we can secure uh, you know, a, a piece of our perimeter against these hostile powers. And of course, if you look to the southwest, there's an area called Tibet. Not directly under the control of foreigners. And if you look at Tibet over here, as you can see, Tibet is a large upland plateau, averaging 15,000 feet up, remarkably small population. China's going to be concerned. What if this vacuum is filled in by the foreigners as well? That would be pressing in on the core of China. We're already in a besieged state of mind as a new communist state. And when we look at Tibet specifically, by and large, it has a population of, little, of, of, of essentially one million or so, about the size of greater San Antonio, spread over a mass, a much larger area. The majority of the population were rural herders in high montane valleys, living a lifestyle that had little changed in a thousand years. The principal urban center is Lhasa. And you can see how underdeveloped the country is by essentially, here's the one major road. The country is remarkably underdeveloped. The very fact that you do not have that type of transportation infrastructure. Tibet is dominated by Tibetan Buddhism. In fact, the capital city of Lhasa means holy place. And so Tibet was essentially a theocracy. I gave you a definition for a theocracy. It's a state where the political leadership and the religious leadership are the same. In fact, the principal built structures in the Tibetan landscapes were Buddhist monasteries. Tibetan Buddhists follow their supreme leader, that being the Dalai Lama, which you can see there seated up in the upper portion of the photo. And you can see that Tibet's location, Tibet's location here is seen as a national security concern in another 
way to the Chinese. The principal rivers of China draw much of the, you know one of the key sources for the moisture in these rivers is the Tibetan Plateau. And so the thought of the Tibetan Plateau, all right, being occupied or controlled by foreigners, which means the Wangho, the Yellow River, all right, the Yangtze River would be in the hands of foreigners, and that was a concern. It may be an overstated or a bit of paranoia. Nevertheless, it was, and thus you can understand what the reaction of the Tibet or the, Ch uh, the Chinese was going to be with respect to this plateau with 15,000 feet up. They saw what had happened in Mongolia. That, that area, once it had a certain amount, once uh, it declared its freedom, was quickly covered by the political and military umbrella of Russia. And they didn't want to see that occur again with respect to Tibet. And so what occurs is China invades Tibet. The very same year the communist China comes into existence, they rush troops into the eastern portion of the country took over the eastern half of the country. They called it Chamdo, but let's not worry about the fineries there. Tibetans appealed for support from the United States, from the British, from the United Nations, but it all fell on deaf ears. And when the Chinese saw that there was little reaction from the West, they progressed further in 1951. They marched in and took over the rest of the country. There would be systematic destruction of monasteries, suppression of religion, denial of political freedom, widespread arrests, and imprisonment. Numerous people simply disappeared. But you know the practical reasons why the Chinese took over Tibet. Naturally, like all invaders, the Chinese said that they were here to liberate the Tibetans from medieval feudal serfdom and slavery. Tibetan serfs or Tibetan agricultural workers were thought to have no freedoms. They were regarded by their employers, their masters, if you would, as little more than talking animals who lived in extreme poverty. And China saw it upon itself to give them freedom and thus equality before the state. That's how the Chinese portrayed it. But all imperial powers, be they communist, capitalist, westerns, always justify the coercive takeover of other people's lands and opportunities as an act of liberation, never as an act of acquisitive greed or power hungriness. In fact, the you can see that here in this poster of uh, during from the Maoist era, where it clearly shows somebody holding Mao's little red book there at the top, and uh, all these young people bringing the future with them, if you would, uh, a future clearly driven by the righteousness on their face to bring about a better world of equality. You could see these type of posters in any imperial power, whether it was from Alexander the Great all the way up into the United States in the latter portion of the 20th century. Nothing new about this type of thing. The Dalai Lama was forced into exile in 1959. You can see that he leaves the country and he, go, he goes to Dharamsala here in northern India where, with about 100,000 of his uh, followers. And uh, they have been in exile ever since. In fact, Tibet here would be formally annexed into China in 1965. I believe it's called Zhejiang. I'm, no doubt I'm mispronouncing that, that name. And thus you can consider Tibet to be really a buffer state. Now, granted, this is a buffer state that has been absorbed into China, but the principal reason that China went into Tibet was not for the material resources of Tibet. You couldn't produce them now effectively. You're talking about an upland plateau 15,000 feet up. Anything you produce here, the transportation costs of getting it out would make it uh, 
irrelevant to do and impractical. All right. They really wanted China as a, uh, excuse me, really wanted Tibet as a buffer zone, one that they absorbed. And so it really is an example of a buffer state, although it's not independent in any case. The Dalai Lama in exile, of course, becomes a very popular figure. In fact, he won a Nobel Peace Prize because he doesn't advocate for a military overthrow of the Chinese, although he does advocate for uh, Tibetan rights and autonomy. Nevertheless, he's a very popular figure by left and right figures alike. But as you can suspect, no matter the rhetoric that outside powers or show the Dalai Lama, they are not going to provide practical support for, and the Dalai Lama is not asking for it, but they're not going to provide any support for a freedom fighter movement in Tibet against China, hardly. And I'll show you why that is momentarily. You should already know, but I'll show you why that nobody's going to be supporting a Tibetan freedom fighter campaign of any sort. That's not an unreasonable thing to say since the United States supported many such freedom fighting campaigns in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s in the world. But nothing's going to happen with respect to China that way for reasons I'll show you in a minute. All right. Now, the most notable recent events we see in China is the evolving economic orientation of the country since 1949. All right. In 1949, when Communist China comes into existence, the Chinese governance decides to concentrate economic development up here in Old Manchuria, this portion, whatever, up here. And the reason why they decided to put it up here is because there was substantial resources up here. In fact, let me put up a graphic here to show you the principal reasons why China decided to, through its command economy, all right, not driven by market forces, through its command economy decided to, let's concentrate our new economic development over here. We need to compete, we need to grow strongly, said the Communist Chinese in 1949, and to be able to remain viable and be a player in the late 20th century capitalist world economy. Well, no, we're not capitalist. Nevertheless, we need to provide opposition to it, and the point being is that here you have the reasons for Chinese emphasizing industrial development way up here in Manchuria. It, Manchuria contains substantial power resources for industrial development, not like unlike you know West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and the United States. All right, these was the great industrial core of the United States because you had so much coal up here. Same thing in China in 1950s, 60s, 70s. That was number one reason. Makes sense. You always put your industry on top of the power resource, so that means the transportation costs for that power resource that you're using are nil. You just dig it up and use it. You don't have to transport it. That's one reason. The second was to relocate the bulk of Chinese industry from the coast to the interior because it was thought that if you put most of your, in your industry on the coast, it would be subject to the Western powers, which came by sea. It was a national security concern. So let's try to move it more towards an internal location. Moreover, thirdly, they wanted to democratize opportunity regionally. You want to provide opportunities to other portions of China, especially to the upper portion of Manchuria. Always keep in mind that Manchuria is an ethnically distinct portion from the core of Mandarin China. You might want to provide opportunity there to tie it into the national economy and affirm in practical terms why it's good to be part of China. You don't want to create an impoverished zone that's going to be looking for opportunities elsewhere, foreign opportunities. And that brings us to point four, to consolidate a disputed area under Chinese control. This area had been coveted by foreigners for some period of time. The Russians have always covered in this portion of China. They've taken other portions nearby, but they've covered it this portion, even the Japanese, as you'll see in a while. So the Japanese actually take over this portion of China. In 1931, because of all the industrial resources, and so you might want to develop it and bring it into the national system. Just imagine if Mexico, in the early 19th century, all right, 
before 1810 in the revolution, if Mexico had developed northeastern Mexico, which you now know as Texas, and brought it into the national system, you would have never gotten the large influx of Anglos who ultimately sought to separate northeastern Mexico away from Mexico and bring it into the United States as Texas and much of the southwest of the United States. In any case, so that's what the reasons why the Chinese concentrated their industry up there. They were ultimately thinking, look, we need to, we're a new communist state, we need to be uh, successful quickly. Now, that was from 1950 to 1970. Notice the dates there. That's to 1970. During this period of time, the Chinese realized that their scheme to quickly develop Manchuria and to quickly develop China rapidly so that they could be competitive in the world economy, especially with respect to keeping pace with the Western economies, well, they realized that they were not succeeding, that things had to change. They were losing ground. You got to give the credit to, to Chinese to, to be able to consciously acknowledge that. Well, you can do that when you have an authoritarian system. There's little opposition. Nevertheless, the results would be dramatic after 1970 when the Chinese admitted that they were still, as a communist, new communist state, losing ground to the Western powers in terms of economic development.